Hello, everyone, and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. I just know that we're back in WSBG training season. My mom and I just got off of a couple games of Cascadia, prepping her for rocking that. Um, and what I want to talk about today is another sort of like 16 tier list of these games that are all at the WSBG. And I want to kind of place them on this chart, uh, sort of variance versus skill chart, or actually it's a two axis thing. You can have a high variance, high skill game, such as poker is kind of the classic example of that. The people who are good keep winning, but there's a lot of luck in poker. Um, and then, of course, you can have a low variance, low skill game. So something like uh, tic-tac-toe, you don't need to be terribly good at to kind of hit the skill ceiling there. Um, but there's not any randomness that's associated with that game. Um, I am going to just caveat right now, none of these 16 games are kind of at the, the very extremes of, you know, low, low, low variance and low, low, low skill. Um, or very high, high, high variance compared to any number of things that are out there. But for demonstrative purposes, this is gonna kind of be like a relative example. So if I put something that is like on the higher side and you're like, well, that's not the highest variance thing that there is out there. You're right, I agree with you. But for the purposes of this video, let's play along and uh, pretend that these, these axes are relative instead of absolute, because if they're absolute, we're gonna have things scrunched a lot more in the middle um, that I'm generally a pretty, uh, pretty conservative in my like statistical estimates and things like that. So I'm putting that aside for this video. Um, so we can kind of talk about these different games. Again, we're gonna go through only in alphabetical order. So no kind of strategic order here, starting at the top ring and moving around. Um, and yeah, without any further ado, let's, let's jump in. We're gonna start off with uh, Seven Wonders as our, our first game here. Um, and Seven Wonders is a game where you certainly need to know what you're good at. The guy who won the the ring last year, Ricky, is a player who I know is good at this game. He's played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So he definitely knows what he's doing. You have to be able to appropriately evaluate what's going on there. That being said, I, I do think that there's sort of a, a limit on that skill ceiling. Um, you can only know so much about this game before you essentially know everything. I think the things that you can do to make yourself better is just sort of understanding the pathing of like what things build into what in the future that comes with experience or studying the cards very, very specifically, but probably more experience. Um, so like, especially kind of in the newer editions, like which yellow cards get to be built off of what things. And so if I'm planning on picking up a yellow card that rewards me for having a bunch of reds what kind of prerequisites or building requisites would I need to have that. So you could have a fair amount of knowledge of this game that will give you just a little bit of a leg up compared to a player who understands the value of the game, but maybe doesn't have that level of experience along with it. And it's kind of, you know, pulls a card and is like surprised. Oh, I really wish I could play that card, but I don't have the appropriate, you know, advanced resource uh, to, to set that up. So there is a skill ceiling here, um, but if, experience comes into play, I think, quite a fair amount. In terms of variance, <clears throat> this is an interesting thing about drafting games. Drafting games have variance, a lot of them. It's a card game. Um, you know, you're going to be dealt out certain cards, and some cards are just better than other cards. Uh, they're also, it's less about cards being better than other cards and more about cards being better in the right situation. So, of course, the palace is worth eight points and the temple is worth seven points, but if you can't play one and you can't play the other, then their valuations are completely different from one another, even though in a vacuum, it's like, well, I'd rather have eight points than seven points. The guilds also highly variant in terms of, especially because most of them score for what your opponents are doing, which you have a lot less control over. Um, and so if you know the two players next to you are going for science and you manage to scoop up that science guild as your first draw, no one kind of like manages, has an opportunity to hate draft it from you. You might just score 10, 12 points off of that card alone. Um, and I think that that, I mean, that doesn't sound like a lot, but in a game where everyone's going to be scoring 50, 60, 70, I think that's about what you score in Seven Wonders, um, a card that's four points more than any other card you would draw makes a really big difference. So I'm gonna put this game certainly on the higher variance side. And there is, um, again, I'm getting into the danger here of if I put everything into like, yes, of course you need some skill to, to play this game. Everything's gonna end up in this, in this uh, blue or red areas here. So I think that the limitation on Seven Wonders relative to the other um, 
games on here it's it's i think it's gonna be a smidge lower i think you can learn this game and perform pretty well having a pretty limited amount of experience in this game i think you could play this game 20 30 40 times and be as you could be a serious threat to someone who's paid 200 300 or 400 times um so I'm going to say that it's a little bit lower on the skill side. I'm going to have so many people yell at me in the comments in this video. Uh, we'll leave it there for now and see if I maybe bump it a little bit later. I'm, I'm maybe being conservative. Uh, <laughs> I'm worried about pushing this a little bit farther down the, the skill chart. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to do it. I'm going to. I think it's just a little bit less. I'm not saying that it's it doesn't have skill, but we're we're making a relative chart here, so um, we got to go somewhere. And I think. I think halfway between high variance and medium variance. No, maybe a little bit less than that because drafting the cards are going to move around. All right, final answer. We're going to leave it like here. All right, our next game is Acquire. If you watched my last video, you know how much I love this game. Acquire is a game that I think is very high variance. You draw random tiles, and drawing the tiles that make the mergers happen matters a ton. Um, I think that acquires one of the highest variance games on this list that doesn't mean that you can't play around luck in fact playing the game is about playing the game well is about playing around luck it's the same as the poker thing right that i talked about earlier if you draw the right tiles then you're going to do well if you set up yourself up so that you could have multiple outs for what tiles you can draw that's good play so you can you know build in such a way that you're like, oh, if I draw, you know, one of these three tiles, I now have options. Um, but some games you're just not going to draw them. Uh, the the again, the two games that I watched, the player that got out to an early lead, um, kind of stayed in an early lead. Having those early hotel um, chain creations and hotel chain mergers, having the appropriate tiles to do that, just makes such a huge difference. And the the space, the opportunities increase you know pretty rapidly throughout the game of like what is good um but then also you hit a part in the game where it's like ah you know x percent of tiles are dead draws and someone has to draw them right like that you're you're you have very you know every turn at the beginning like almost no dead draws but then later on it's 10 percent chance 20 percent chance 30 percent chance of a completely dead draw so i think acquire is a a, a high skill game the next question, or sorry, high variance game. The next question we need to ask ourselves is about the skill ceiling. And you have to ask yourself the question of, is memorization a skill? I have, I don't like memorization. In games, I personally think that almost all games are improved without having a memory component to them. Um, but you certainly need to be very attentive. You need to know what's important to pay attention to. Uh, and Acquire is a game where if you have a sense of where your opponents are at, or if you have a perfect memory for where they're all at, you are going to be a leg up on your opponents. And so I'm gonna, for this video, argue that that is a skill ceiling. And it's it's in part because if you've played a bunch of times, you're probably better at memory um, than someone who hasn't played a bunch of times for this kind of skill, but also just folks who are, you know, have that sort of like memory focus um, are going to be sort of better off a little bit naturally, like not necessarily inherent with this game. Um, I'll also say that I see often similar players at the WBC, the World Board Gaming Championships um, in Pennsylvania, winning this game or at least kind of winding up in the semifinals or finals of this game. So I think that it's a higher, a higher skill ceiling than Seven Wonders. But I also think that there's only so much you can do right like you're just you're managing money a lot of times it's like snap correct choice to you know buy xyz stocks um and then you have to have that like memory component there so i think this is quite a high variance game and uh, maybe a slightly above average skill ceiling something like that maybe we'll see how that goes arc nova's next Okay, I have played a ton of Arc Nova on PGA now, and I like Arc Nova, but bear with me when I say this is one of the highest variance games that is in this entire list. I think it is a higher variance game than Seven Wonders. I don't know that it's a higher variance game than Acquire, um, but it is right up there. The reason is that your opening hand can can 
snowball you into such a, a deep, powerful strategy. Cards in this game are not created equally. You don't get a ton of card draws in this game. There's no drafting mechanism to kind of smooth it out like there is in Terraforming Mars, although I'll, I'll get to that when we get there. I think that the variance in Arc Nova is quite large. Um, I also think the skill ceiling is, is really high in this game. The first few times you play this game, you'll probably do okay, but it's just really easy to stumble on your face if you don't understand the flow of the association workers and tempo of breaks and everything like that. Um, you're gonna you're gonna just die in a way that other games or not die, but get crushed by someone who does know what they're doing, does understand the flow of that uh, more than you do. The money in this game is very tight. When we did our original podcast on this, I called this a game of restrictions. Um, and I still stand by that. You are really trying to not get yourself backed into a corner, or if you are backed into a corner, bind yourself out of the corner. So um, I think Arc Nova is going to fall in like high skill, high variance. The better you get, the better you are at this game. I do think at a certain limit, you're just as good as you're going to be and you're not going to get better. So I think Arc Nova is going to end somewhere like here is what we're looking at right now. Um, Yeah, great. Let's go to Azul. Okay, there is certainly variance in Azul, although I think less than the other three games that we've talked about. Um, you're going to put the, the the tiles out there, and you know the players who are earlier in turn order want to have you know those three or four flops, um, and that that can make a really big difference. I actually think maybe even a bigger difference that can happen in Azul is if you're, you know, looking for a specific color, like this two blue is going to make a really big difference for me, and then you flip all single blues or only a couple blues, and maybe other players are also looking for it at the same time. Um, Fair amount of variance in, like, how those tiles come out. Uh, That being said, you're certainly going to go through all the tiles kind of in the first run of the bag, so it's, it's like, what is appropriate in the given turn. Um, And... It's a it's a game where it's a game where you start off and everybody is on exactly equal footing. But then as you get into the second, third, and fourth turn, that's not true anymore. You have your own board state. If I have, you know, second column material and tiles flip out that are easier to place in the fourth and fifth columns, I'm gonna be behind my opponent who's got third, fourth, or fifth column setups. Um, that being said, because the tiles aren't a diagonal, you can make almost anything work. So it's it's about getting locked out of those very specific times. I do think it's lower variance than all these other games, um, but it's certainly not low variance. I think it's going to end up actually somewhere in the middle here. And then in terms of skill, I think Azul is a game that rewards people who know what they're doing. I think you're going to see um, the same people rising to the top. But I think once you've kind of learned and understood the math of this game, you're at your limit. Like there is not much that you can do. I think I'm quite good at Azul. And I say that I'm going to say, I think it's a lower skill ceiling game because I don't think the difference in skill in the past 50 games that I've played compared to the first 50 games that I've played, I'd have to look at board game arena, see if I've actually played a hundred games, but that's probably a reasonable guess. Um, hasn't changed that much. And I got to think about seven wonders here. It's interesting because these, I'm trying to to rate this on like a two axis, but the thing is that I think the gap in um, skill between your first game and your 10th game of Azul is a much bigger skill jump than it is for Seven Wonders. But I think the gap between like a game 10 and game 100, you get a lot more in Seven Wonders than you get in Azul. Um, So I think Azul's got to be maybe a smidge lower than Seven Wonders. And... Yeah, I think kind of medium variance. I think this is where I'm going to put Azul. It's going to live right there blocking my thing. Um, (laughs) And we'll move on to Brass Birmingham. Brass Birmingham is a game with very, very limited variance. There is variance in this game um, in terms of what cards you draw and what options you have available. But because you have the scout action, you can generally box yourself out of it because a lot of cards are functionally multi-use right every card can be used to develop every card can be used to do rails and canals and loans and all that stuff so you're really only looking kind of for a few key cards um you might have to take the scout action to make that happen if you get none of your key cards you can get really um hosed uh and certainly a few locations are going to be nicer to have than others that being said i think you can craft a game plan with just about anything that you draw in this game i think there are sub 
like one percent of hands that are like you'd argue to be like unplayable but maybe players who have a much better sense of this game um would disagree with me and say that there's there's more variance i think actually the more skilled you are in this game the more sensitive you are to the variance of the cards um but i think largely i think largely it's a very low variance game i also think it's quite a high skill game um not just because the rules are complex but because there's a lot of jockeying for position understanding what it is that other players are doing it's a very living breathing market that rewards you for paying attention to what other people are doing paying attention to your game plan the one kind of um so it's it's gonna end up somewhere over here the one thing i kind of want to ramble about before i sort of land on what brass actually looks like is that um one thing that brass doesn't have or one thing that people sorry one thing that people don't talk about in variants that i think is very very important in gaming that people just don't discuss and i disagree with it is variants of how other people are playing at the table and brass is a game where other players at the table making uncharacteristic actions um, or just kind of surprising moves can really throw off your game plan and i think it is something that i think that the randomness of what other players choose to do is 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 uh, more significant in a lot of games and i think brass is one of those games that that has that so i'm going to say on the lower side of variance and then probably this is probably one of the highest skill games at this tournament so something like that maybe is where we're going to put them all right so let's move on to cascadia so Cascadia is a game that I've been playing a little bit more recently. And here's an interesting question about variants. Cascadia is a game where everything is good. And so since everything is good, what makes a difference is if this thing is worth just a smidge more than that thing. And if you can get a smidge more points this time over and over and over again, you're going to wind up winning the game. Do we consider that to be low variance or high variance? And, you know, your scores, they're probably going to differ by, like, 90 to 100. You know, 10, 10, 15, maybe 20 points if you get really blown out. Um, I think short of you not understanding how things score, you're going to be in the same ballpark with other folks most of the time when you play this game. So I would argue that Cascadia is actually on the lower variance side because just about everything is playable and you can use nature tokens to minimize that variance as well if you don't have the specific animal that you need um, or you know you want to like cross an animal with a certain territory it's a, a really basic point valuation because those nature tokens are worth one point i actually think this game would be improved if the nature tokens were worth zero points um, and you're encouraged to just use them throughout the game that would be a change that i would i would really consider playing as a house rule um, because I think using them is fun but since you're paying a point every time and the game's really tight that's maybe not worth it uh, so I'm going to argue that, that Cascadia is a lower variance game than, than almost all the other games that we've talked about so far um, and the skill ceiling similarly is going to be kind of a little bit more limited we've definitely been getting better my mom and I were playing this game kind of understanding the scoring of the different cards but if you're good at math, if you are good at kind of counting out, paying attention to what everybody's doing um, in general in games, I think you're going to be the difference between your first game and your fifth game and your fifth game and your 20th game. They're not as large as they are in some of these other games. So I'm going to argue that Cascadia is on the low variance, lower skill side um, or lower skill ceiling side, I should really say. And I really should call this like lower skill ceiling because I think all games you're, you're rewarded all of these 16 games you're rewarded for having higher skill um yeah I'm, I'm liking where cascadia is there let's move on to castles of burgundy castles of burgundy game that you know how much i i love if you watched my last video um has a lot of dice and so i think that gives it the perception of being a very high variance game uh, i think that would be a misperception i think that castles of burgundy um you can sometimes have some really unlucky or frustrating streaks, but mostly it's a game where, again, like Cascadia, almost everything is good. So you kind of just need to figure out what's most important. And then players who are really good at this game know when to essentially press 
um, you know, use workers and press on the things that they need to do regardless of what their dice say versus like just kind of doing what the dice say and you're like, okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty good along the way there. Um, in some ways, I would argue that the biggest variance in this game is who gets to go first on the first turn, more so than the, the number of dice that you roll throughout the game, but I guess it sort of depends on what your very first die roll is anyway. Um, so I'm going to actually argue that Castles of Burgundy is a uh, lower variance than it's basically in the same vein as Cascadia where there's just there's just so much going on there's so many rewards that it's it's around that area of lower variance even though it looks like a game um that is higher variance I think it's going to sit like here ish maybe and then Castles of Burgundy certainly is going to fall into the higher skill ceiling people that are good at this game are always leaps and bounds better it's sky on bga who's like rating in this game is like 700 something i guess you could say that for for um, almost every game someone is at the top but um this one just feels like uh, a game where people who really know how to evaluate things are gonna crush the folks who who don't um that being said again like with cascadia i think once you i'm gonna actually bump this down a little bit uh because i think once you do understand the scoring once you do understand the scoring your your the difference between playing game 50 and playing game 100 is maybe not so much but now i'm thinking about this relative to arc nova i think it's maybe a smidge below arc nova because of how you play to your outs whereas castles of burgundy it's a lot more like on the paper and in, in play but i think it's pretty close to on tier so maybe something like this i don't know um I don't know it well enough, honestly. Dune Imperium. Dune Imperium has variance, has a pretty limited variance, I would say. It's got variance in terms of, I guess, what conflicts come out, what intrigue cards you draw. That's probably the most variance in the game. What, um, well, I guess also the row, right? The, the purchase row, whatever that's called, the card purchase row. Um, and especially because that card purchase row replenishes immediately from player's turn to player turn so you know if you buy something decent and flip something amazing for me and i'm next in turn order that's pretty sweet so that, but but that's it beyond that you know we're just talking about how other players are playing what other players are going to focus on jockeying for position and things like that um oh you also of course have the luck of how you draw the cards from your deck so if you are just constantly um if you're constantly, you know, shuffling your diplomacy to the bottom of your deck, then it might you might not draw it between like one cycle and another. I do think that players in this game are responsible for managing their deck, understanding what cards are left and determining whether they should when they're drawing more cards if they should be based on how many cards are left in their deck. This game is, I think demands that you pay more attention to that like deck building side of like what is left in my deck than most other games do. Um, but shuffling the certain cards to the bottom, shuffling the best cards to the bottom, you know, if you buy Opulence or Jessica and it's right at the top uh, versus at the bottom, that's definitely a fair amount of variance. So I'm, I'm actually talking to myself. I was originally thinking this is a, a lower variance game and I'm seeing all these different areas where these little benefits, because this game is so tight, the little benefits make a much bigger difference. It's actually kind of the opposite of the Cascadia and Castles of Burgundy problem where a small amount of variance here um, leads to a much more significant impact whereas in Cascadia and Castles of Burgundy because there's so many instances of things and they're quite similar to each other um, that variance is an essentially smoothed out but in Dune Imperium that's not true I mean that the cards you can buy from that card row are not even remotely um, in the same class of each other even at the same costs of purchase I would say remotely is maybe unfair but uh yeah and and then i do think that this is a higher skill game you have to know the flow the patterns um i think in a way that probably rewards folks who are good at this game more than arc nova i would say so in a game that's really tight you want to know those little things. You want to know what to do with like XYZ intrigue card when you draw it. And where am I feeling on the variance here? I think I've convinced myself actually that it's 
I think I've convinced myself that it is more variant than Castles of Burgundy, but not by a lot. So maybe we'll do something like just just a smidge into the high variance. Is that right? No, I'm going to put a smidge into low variance, but still more than Castles of Burgundy. That's where we film. All right, that's where we're at. Guy Project. Guy Project is a game that has essentially no randomness in it. You deal at the beginning what things look like. The randomness is your turn order and um, selecting your faction, which is very, very important. And you could argue is a very, very significant randomness. Um, but you could also play, I guess, with the bidding variant, which they don't at WSPG. Uh, so that's something to consider, I guess. Um, so setup is, is variable. But beyond that, nothing random happens for the rest of the game. Everything else is perfectly pure information. And you are, this is where my kind of uh, comment earlier about randomness of other players, what other folks decide is important. You can try to guess like, oh, I think they have this plan and they're going to evaluate this and try to cut them off or not let them cut you off um, by anticipating those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, how people play and what they focus on is not the same and short of you you knowing them that's essentially the the kind of variance there is in guy project that being said i think that is less variance than anything we've talked about here including brass birmingham um although it depends again on how you evaluate that setup you could argue that any given game of guy project has more variance in the setup and who gets to choose their faction first because the asymmetries are so unbalanced in this game um, but that being said, lots of the factions are great. I'm going to say that Gaia Project is, is quite low variance, and it is extremely high skill. Um, you could play this game. The difference between playing this game once and ten times and ten times and a hundred times and a hundred times and a thousand times um, is, I think, a very, very, very big difference because there are so many asymmetries. There are so many different ways that the um, tracks look and everything like that that... Um, people are just always, always, always getting better at this game. I play on BGA and... You know, the other day I beat someone with a 500 rating, and then the day after that I got I lost to someone with a 100 rating. Like it's just, it's, it's so interesting how a game with such low variance can have such diverse results from really just the choices that you've made throughout the course of the game and the choices of the other players. I also think that Gaia Project is a higher skill ceiling than Brass Birmingham is. Um, there's just a lot more that you can learn. I think there's a lot more space in this game, a lot more decisions, uh, so many resources, so many technologies, so many different perks and bonuses along the way. It's just, it's just a lot. It's a lot. Great Western Trail. I have a lot of opinions about Great Western Trail, unsurprisingly. Great Western Trail is a game that is very, very high skill. Um, the difference between game one, 10, 100 is a, is a very big difference. Maybe after 100, things start to peter out a fair amount. I think you, at that point, you've, you've probably sort of learned what it is that you're doing um, and kind of maybe running a system a little bit more. Um, variance in Great Western Trail is interesting in that when you first start playing the game, it feels like it has a ton of variance because of the cows. And then you play the game a little bit more and you're like, ah, okay, I can... I can control this a little bit more. And then when you're really good again, you're like, ah, the way that you draw these cards from, cards from the cow deck can make a really um, huge difference, especially kind of the differences and, you know, your first lap draws, you having two extra dollars or me having two extra dollars or me being able to take this action because I drew my white cow when I needed to, um, it can make a really big difference. So it's got higher variance certainly than other games I think of this kind of um, other games that are like of the similar kind of weight class as this game because of the way your cow cards draw um, I would not really consider setup in this game to be variants I guess who goes first second third and fourth is 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 variant in this game and uh, what else oh the way that hazards and the way that hazards and employees come out throughout the course of the game actually can have a really big impact. Hazards especially, depending on the way that you've sort of set up at the beginning. Um, if you, you know, place somewhere in a hazard or like a hazard spot, you've placed a building in a hazard spot or I forget what they're called exactly. Uh, and then you start drawing hazards of that type. It can make a really big difference. I played a game at the WBC last year against a player who's very, very good. And 
um, I placed something there and then we drew no hazards of that type for the first two thirds of the game. And it just put me far, far ahead of everybody else because I repeatedly got to, to take bonuses there. So I would say that the variance in Great Western Trail is like on par with Castles of Burgundy, maybe a little bit less, but pretty close to it. Um, I'm going to put Great Western Trail like here, here, something like that. I think Great Western Trail is similar skill ceiling to Brass Birmingham. Something like that. Patchwork. Uh, Patchwork is a game with, I think, really basically no variance. I mean, it's... You, you've set up the circle at the beginning. That's variance. And who gets to go first based on that circle? That's variance. And then everything beyond that is uh, something that Deep Blue could solve for us, right? I think, I think that Patchwork is a chess-like game and that you could theoretically with a supercomputer just math out what the correct choice is. Maybe that's because it's two player and not four player, so there's less kind of um, bouncing around, but because there's kind of limited actions of what you can take and what goes the where, I do think that Patchwork is a game that is just solved by a really, really smart computer. So that's gotta be on the low variance side. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as low variance, I would say, as Gaia Project. And I think Patchwork is very, very skill testing. Um, I suck at it. And I think once you get good at it, you know, you understand the math, you can kind of count what goes here and there, then the number of decision spaces is less than that of something like Gaia Project or maybe Brass Birmingham. But someone who's good is just going to win. You know, not it's, it's it's someone who's very very good at patchwork is going to be like me playing Grandmaster in chess. Like it just it's they they will just be me. I'm trying to think if that's true about like I mean there's an argument to be made for patchwork to like be like here, right? Um, but I I my what I want to do is put it here because I think that the the math and the decision space is just smaller than those other games. I want it to be like at the same tier as like Dune though at least. So maybe something like this, but I do think it's extremely low variance, even lower than Gaia Project because there's a setup. And it's like the lowest, Patrick has the least luck of anything on here. All right, let's go to Raw. We're back into our high variance games, baby. Um, Raw's a game that I really like. I think that uh, one of the things I like about this game is that you can push your luck. When something is a push your luck game, it inherently has variance. What you draw from the bag is just highly, highly volatile. Where you draw it in the turn order really makes a big difference. Um, how those flips come out in the first round? Did you, you know, have a couple? Did you buy a couple reasonable lots at the beginning, but then just you're not flipping raw tiles with the expectation of what people you know have coming? Are there 30 raw tiles left in the bag, but or 30 tiles left in the bag, but there's only one raw tile and it's the first one that you draw? There's just so many various stories um, of how raw has just nutty, nutty variants. It's 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 as, as high variance as anything else on here. So I'm gonna put it all the way to the right. Um, but you have to really understand how to evaluate lots in this game. And I think that that part is something that you can train people, but the like mitigating luck stuff, like, is this worth bidding on? Am I gonna get bounced out here? I think that you really need to know what you're doing you really need to know like how likely it is that you're going to get um, in the round or how many points is, is enough points for something. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, I, uh, this is another one where it's like kind of interesting. The difference between, I think the difference between like one game, 10 games, 10 games and 25 games is quite large and raw. I think the difference between like, 50 and 100 is not as significant as it is maybe for some of these other games. I want to put this like higher, but I think that's where it sits. We're going to leave Raw there. Splendor. Splendor is 
let's see, the variance in Splendor, aside from turn order, um, is how the cards come out and if you reserve a random card from the top. How the cards come out does really matter, and this is a lot more like Dune Imperium in that the, there are not that there's not necessarily as many points of variance as it is in some of these other games but the points of variance that are there are significant if i have sort of you know green gems blue gems um as my set and i we keep flipping out green and blue costing things whereas my opponents don't have those prepared um it's gonna make it it's gonna make a significant difference um that being said i think splendor is also clearly a high higher skill than i think it is um the people that were at the the final table this year were all like brainiacs and poker professionals um my guess and this is really less educated than anything else is that is that splendor is like here fairly significant variance in how those things come out Although once you kind of plot a path, I mean, I guess that's what reserving is for, but still reserving is limited by turn order and the card has to come out anyway. I think past maybe the first round, what cards flip out does make a difference. And some cards are just strictly better than other cards, notably in this game. Yep, we're gonna put it there. Terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars is a game that has a lot of cards like Arc Nova, a lot of cards that are not equally built like Arc Nova. That being said, you tend to see, I think a smidge more cards than you do in Arc Nova, and they tend to be less of a, I was gonna say death sentence, but um, they tend to less directly dictate which game is gonna look like. I think because of the things like standard projects and I mean, which are not ideal, but okay, and particularly in a five player game, there's always kind of ways to, to take advantage in terraforming Mars. The thing is that like later, later on in the game, early on drafting is interesting, right? Because it's like, ooh, this is a really good card to play late or a really good card to play early. Should I take this card? Or do I want to pay the three credits for this card? The fact that every card costs money is the thing that actually decreases variance in this game because you can essentially just say, all right, well, I won't take the card if it's not good for me or my circumstance. But then later in the game, especially, um, when you draw the right card and someone else doesn't draw the right card, it makes a really big difference. And I know some people are like, ah, drafting solves this game. I, I call BS on that. I don't believe that drafting decreases all that much luck in Terraforming Mars especially later on in the game because when you're dealt a hand of four cards and one of them is playable and the other three are garbage um it doesn't really feel like that's extremely fair compared to the player that drew nothing that was playable the player that drew three cards that were playable um so the, the variance matters in this game and i think i think that that drafting does not solve it in fact if anything it might even as exacerbate it that's maybe a bold statement but um Drawing cards also, like there's just a lot of chaff in this deck. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of like bounce into things. Terraforming Mars is on the higher variant side, but less than Arc Nova. And it's it's high skill, but I've beaten people who've played this game way, way, way more than I have. And people who are less experienced than I have, have, have walloped me too. Sometimes you can just kind of snowball with certain sorts of systems in this game. I think it's on the higher variant side. I think it has less variance than the kind of big boys on the right there probably more variance than splendor and i think i think the skills the skill ceiling even though this is a more complex game i think the skill ceiling is actually lower than splendor and lower than raw because of this at a certain point you you kind of understand like how to evaluate cards better i mean there's a lot of cards so I didn't give it to Seven Wonders about like how how much value there is and sort of understanding and knowing all the cards. So there is a difference there. Like if if you think that knowing all the cards in the deck makes a big big difference in terms of how you're playing, then Terraforming Mars goes up and Arc Nova goes up and Seven Wonders goes up. But I think I think you can have a pretty good sense 
after having played the game 20 30 times about like what's good what's around what cards are playable and not i'm gonna put it there yeah we'll leave it there ticket to ride ticket to ride is a i mean it depends on how you play this game but i'm gonna call it it's not not it's it's definitely variants right like you're drawing cards off the deck and one of the more ideal strategies is to draw the same cards off the top of the deck you want to draw cards that are you're collecting sets right when you're collecting sets like you're hoping to draw cards of the same type not only that but you're hoping to draw cards of the same type in the roots that you want to be playing so that's certainly variants you get to mitigate your variants a little bit with wild cards um, and by the fact that there are multiple paths that you can go on um, but it's certainly variants and then the drawing tickets at the beginning and if you draw tickets in the middle crazy amount of variance and and that so on the higher variance side i don't think it's I, again don't get me wrong shout out to to jay who tried to help me out for the semifinal last year if i was a little bit better a little bit more attentive i know for a fact i could have won my semifinal so you can ha- you can be experienced in this game i can see that but i don't think that the difference between playing the game 50 times and 100 times is that much i think actually someone is maybe better suited by memorizing what the roots look like rather than playing a whole bunch of times or maybe playing a whole bunch of times helps you memorize what the roots look like but by knowing what the roots are you're probably already a huge leg up on on people who are not as aware of that but in terms of like what the play is and the focus i think we're we're talking about less skill than azul more skill than Cascadia something like that as much maybe yeah I think as much variance is acquired not because the the gameplay is fine it's specifically about the the um the tickets at the beginning and the end what they look like and if they if they match up with each other the setup variance is just it's it's just quite large in this game ticket to ride last game wingspan all right, wingspan is weird because there are a handful of birds that I think are just crazy good um, in comparison to the other birds. If no one draws those birds, you have one kind of game. If multiple people draw those birds, you have a different kind of game. If you have people like one person or two people draw those birds and then the other people don't draw those birds, you kind of have two different games, I think. Um, so if you're playing with all of the base birds in the base game, I would argue that Wingspan is a high variance game because there is chaos in terms of what the setup is gonna look like. I think the odds of like, I'd have to like sit down and actually do the math, but I wouldn't be surprised if the odds of like drawing one of these very powerful birds in an initial setup, even that huge stack of cards is probably something like 25 30 percent and if the odds that one of them shows up in the game disorients the game that happens one in four games like that's that's pretty wild to me um drawing cards off the top of this deck what food you roll is not i mean it can really hose you if you re-roll and you're looking for one specific you know worm easy to find and you just don't get them um but I'm, I'm not as put off by that as I am by the, the variance of the birds. So I, I would say this is on the higher variance side. Probably in the same tier as Terraforming Mars. Because it's got the same issue of like, am I drawing these cards unfairly? There's no mitigating factor like the drafting in Terraforming Mars. But Yeah, probably a little bit more variance than Terraforming Mars. Um, and Wingspan is a game that rewards people for being good, understanding how to, to play the flow of games uh, and to play the flow of get this game in particular. I think that it's not as... I think it's like... This is actually quite similar to Terraforming Mars, honestly. Um, maybe a little bit lower skill ceiling... Because at a certain, essentially, you're, what you're learning over time is how to evaluate the different bird powers, and at a certain point, I think you you kind of have a 
pretty good sense already of, of what that looks like. Okay, we're gonna run it. We're gonna ship it. This is this is this is our <laughs> World Series of Board Gaming Skill versus Variance chart. I know that if you're watching this video, you disagreed with something. You're welcome to tell me in the comments. But um, you know, I, all of this is really fuzzy. Grading any of these is is nonsense anyway. This I just thought it would be a fun activity. But I'm happy to have a discussion about what you think uh, I missed or what you think I missed by a fair amount. Um, and and why that might be the case, and certainly the order in which things came out um, impacted my decision, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that if I did this a year from now, I'd probably have some slightly different answers um, as time goes by, and yeah. But this was fun to do. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.